I appreciate my daddy opening the pulpit up for me today and let me be here. And he's always so kind to me and so good, and I appreciate that. And I thank my friends that are here this morning. You mean a lot to me. And those of you that are watching on Facebook Live, that are listening in the parking lot, you think of this. What we've been through in the last eight months or so, did you ever think about this? God's promised to see us through that. He's still seeing us through it, and he will continue to see us through it. Those of you that's had breast cancer and those that was the video here just a few moments ago, and, and Beverly, it's hard to believe it's been 24 years since you're only 25. It's amazing. But you know that I, I think of the promises of God, and that's the title of our, our message this morning that I want to share with you. I believe God has laid this on my heart over the last few weeks. I've been thinking about different things, and, and folks that make promises, we make promises, and if I make you a promise, I may let you down. But I want to remind you, God does never let us down. Amen. He has never let us down one time. Now, I may not agree with everything that he does. I get confused at some of the things that he does and the way that he works. But this morning, is, as we look at the scripture, and I want you, if you do not have a handout, if you're in this auditorium and you have one in handout, there, uh, I've got some in the back that they'll bring you one. If you want, raise your hand. If you don't have one, you'd like one to follow along this morning. And I will be. I'm real sensitive to time, and I will be as brief as possible. But I want to get this message I believe that God has given me to share with you this morning. Amen. If you would, turn with me to 2 Peter, the third chapter and the ninth verse. The last couple of weeks, Eddie was talking about prayer time a couple of weeks ago and he talked about that verse there in second chronicles said which my people which are called by my name if there's a number of things that we need to do and then mike last week as he was preaching on the sounds of the coming uh -huh. and he quoted this verse of scripture and i was thinking of this verse of scripture there in second peter and it's talking a little bit about the second coming but when he says here as peter says the lord is not slack concerning his promise oh. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, that not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Now when you think of the word of these promises that God has given you, God has given me promises. In his word, he's given us so many promises. You think of this, a promise is this, it's, it's like a guarantee. A, a promise is something like a contract. Or something where you assure someone, I'm making you this promise. We used to have a thing called promise rings. And many of you may have had those promise rings and they're good intentions. And then there's those promise keepers, which I was a part of for uh, several years that we used to have at Thompson Bowling Arena. Great things. But we think of these promises and those covenants that we make. And you think of this God, as God has declared here and what it promise means. It's a declaration to do or to refrain from doing something. It's something you are saying that I'm, I'm declaring I will do this or I will refrain from doing. That's what a promise is. I think of the verse of scripture there in Titus and on your hand that you'll have it. In Titus the first chapter in that second verse it says, In hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie. When he promises us something, he cannot lie. Amen. And there's so many promises. I, I heard that there was over a minimum of 7,000 promises in God's word. Wow. Can you imagine over 7,000 or right at 7,000 promises that in God's word that he's made to us? Amen. He's made us promises. Now you and I need to hang on to those promises. Amen. We sang a song a few songs back saying, standing on the promises of God. Yeah. And he cannot lie. He says in Titus 1, 2, that uh, God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So you and I need to cling on to that and know that God cannot lie if he's made you a promise. Just like in the song that was just sung. I want you to notice, and I'm going to hurry along, but I've got kind of two within one today. You're getting a two-for-one deal. I'm going to give you five little things that I believe that are promises of God. And then when we, at the end of this last point, I want us to look at Daniel, the third chapter. And here's what I want you to know. The first promise I want you to know is this, the promise of redemption. He said there in 2 Peter, he said, God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. I want to tell you something this morning. You may be watching, you may be listening, or you're in this auditorium this morning. God's will is for you to be saved. Amen. Now it's up to you. But God's will is this. He's made you a promise of what we call redemption. In Romans the 10th chapter and the 13th verse, it plainly says this. It says, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise. 
That's a promise. He also says there in Ephesians, the first chapter, in Ephesians, the first chapter, and in that seventh verse, notice what he says when he's talking about the promise of redemption. You and I think of a uh, of promise that we give and things that are that have promised that uh, we've broken those promises. But when he said in Ephesians, the first chapter, and in that seventh verse, he says it plainly. He says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Amen. I want you to notice something about this. Your Bible that if you're holding a Bible right now contains 66 books. There is 39 in that Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, what we call the canon, the Bible. That Bible that was written in three original languages, Hebrew, Greek, and a little bit of Aramaic. That is what we call the Bible. The Bible is made up of what is called the scarlet thread. The scarlet thread that goes all the way through the Bible. Everything points to one thing, redemption. You and I need redemption, and it's only through God's Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we see the promise of redemption. There's a second promise that I believe God has made to us is the promise of reaping. This is a promise that you and I are going to reap what we sow. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of us that goes through life saying this, you know, thinking, you know, I'm just going to live any way I want to, but I can promise you you cannot live like hell and then just expect God to bless your life. Amen. We cannot do that. And we know that in the society we live in today, the people says, well, I'll just do whatever I want to, and then one day I'll make it right. Yeah. You reap what you sow. Amen. There's the principles of reaping is this. You, you reap exactly what you sow. You reap it more than you sow, and you always reap it later than you sow. You, you as a parents and you raising children, you remember this. You reap what you sow. In Galatians, the sixth chapter, starting in that seventh verse, it says, Be not, conceived, be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Yeah. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall reap the Spirit of life everlasting. Amen. You and I need to realize that God has made it plain. He says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. There's an old song and an old hymnal in page 330 of the old hymnal most of you are familiar with. It's called, We'll Reap What We Sow. I want to read you what the first verse says. It it says, oh, let us be careful in sowing our seed while tolling for Jesus below. So only the things that the Spirit will need will reap whatever we sow. Yeah, you think of this, those things that, that we are reaping, this nation as a whole, Amen. we are reaping what we have sown. Amen. I was born in the early 60s, Amen. and I can remember there is a turning point in this nation. Uh -huh. That when we have turned away from God. And now we've, uh, we have we begun to reap what we have sown. Amen. And I believe that you and I need to know the promise of reaping, that it is true. The third thing I would give you is the promise of the resurrection. What is the promise of the resurrection? I'm going to just give you a couple of verses real quickly. In Job, the 14th chapter, and he says in the 14th verse, If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Ye shall live again. There is the promise God has made of what we call the resurrection. Now we look in the New Testament and we see there that, that very familiar scripture, scripture in Luke the ninth chapter. And then the 22nd verse. Notice what he says when he's talking about the, the promise of the resurrection. In Luke the ninth chapter, you and I, we know the familiar story of, of the resurrection of Christ. But he says in Luke the ninth chapter in that 22nd verse, he says, Saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. Amen. You know the promise of the resurrection. That great promise when we go and we go to these funerals and we have to talk at a graveside. We always have hope of that one that is a believer. Yes. That one has put their trust in Christ that we sit there and we think of. There is the promise God has made me a promise. Amen. You promised me God the resurrection. Amen. Those loved ones that you and I have on the other side. Yes. That's the promise. I'm clinging to that. That one day this resurrection to be reunited. I believe it is a real thing. I believe that God has promised that, and it is true. The fourth thing, very hurriedly, is this, the promise of return. Mike has been speaking, doing a great job, preaching uh, off and on these last few weeks, talking about the return of Christ and the second coming of Christ. I want you to notice that, that real familiar scripture in John, the 14th chapter, and those first three verses. There was the promise of the return. He said this, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my Father's house are many mansions. Amen. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Listen to this third verse. And if I go, I'm going. He says, I will come again. I love that passage right there where he says it. He says it so plainly. I will come again. I'm promising you right now. There's many of you I've let down by making a promise to you. I'll be there somewhere at a certain time. I'll do something for you. And I've let you down. But I want to remind you God's promises. He cannot lie. Amen. He's made us a promise that he would return. He says, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. We see in Acts the first chapter, in Acts the first chapter and at the 11th verse, he said, Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner. And as you've seen him go into the heaven. Listen, you and I need to cling to these first four promises I've given you. The promise of redemption, that you can be saved. That scarlet thread that goes throughout the Bible. The promise of reaping that you and I, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Yes, sir. The promise of the resurrection yes, sir. that you and I are promised. Not only that Christ promised about his resurrection, but that you and I yes. can be resurrected. Yes, and then the promise that he is coming back. Yes, it's a promise that he's going to keep. Yes, that promise that he is going to return. The fifth thing that I want us to set here for just a moment, and I want you to bear with me for just a few moments, and, and I want us to look at the promise of what we would call rescue. There's many of you that may be watching, you may be listening, you may be in this room today. You say, that all sounds really good. That promise of redemption. I'm saved. I've been saved. I saved as a little boy. I, I, I believe that promise of reaping. I, I know what I sow I'm going to reap and I, I'm going to suffer the consequences. I believe in the resurrection. I believe that promise. I believe the promise of the return. But when I'm talking about the promise of the rescue... They, some of you in this room today needs rescue. Amen. You've got something in your life right now. I don't know what it is. You do. You and God alone may know. If you're listening, you're watching, and you say, I need rescued. There's something in my life I need a rescue from. Amen. I want us to turn to what I would call a very familiar story. Now, th here's the problem with sometimes with familiar stories in the Bible. Here's what happens with you and I. Sometimes being familiar with something prevents us from really benefiting from the story. It's kind of like a, the, I, was, I read a statistic that most car accidents happen within just a few miles of your home. And it's because we become lackadaisical. We're so familiar with the surroundings. I heard of a man one time who had an uncle that wasn't real bright. And he heard about this statistic that most accidents happen within just five miles of his home. Well, the old guy just up and moved. <laughs> That'll go right over your head. But what I'm saying is because of this familiar story, Daniel the third chapter. Turn with me to Daniel the third chapter. And I want to sit here for just a moment. And I want to finish with this, this passage of scripture and share with you the promise of rescue. Uh -huh. Whatever it is you're going through right now, an addiction. It can be a, a, a health issue. Whatever it is, you need rescued from it. Yes, sir. And I want us to look at this because it is a familiar story that you and I have heard this story for a number of, number of years. But this story is very simple because there is a promise that God made. God promised to deliver them from, the, the, from captivity and restore them as a nation. Amen. If you know the story of Daniel, and as we come to chapter number 3, I want you to notice something. And, and I'm going to begin in, in verse number 13. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, I want to I educate you on something here because I got educated on it. I have called him Shadrach for years. I was corrected. It's Shadrach. So, I don't know Hebrew. I barely know English. <laughs> but I can tell you this, that there's a reason that we come to this in, verse, in chapter number 1 and verse number 7 they changed the names Nebuchadnezzar changed their names uh -huh. and that was a sign of them being under submission to him yeah. the original names was simple in verse number 7 of chapter 1 he says unto him the prince, the prince of eunuchs gave names for he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar and to Hananiah Shadrach and to, uh, to uh, Mishael Meshach 
and to Azariah Abednego. Now we know this story as the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those three Hebrew children we called them. They weren't children. Probably were there from the age of 17 to 18. And then at this time in chapter number 3 was probably around the ages of early 20s. I'm so proud of Aaliyah and Luke this morning. Those young people. I love, I love, I love to see that. I love my, my boys as, as they have taken part. And, and it interjects your church. You need a good combination. At New Beverly Baptist Church, you need a good combination of some young folks and some, and some old folks and some dead folks that have given money. And, and that's what you need. But here's what I would say. These young children, these young Hebrew children, they weren't children. But these three Hebrews, and then we come to chapter 3, and let me set the stage just a little bit. There's going to be this big celebration, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. He has built a statue. Now, I'm not going to argue with Bible scholars. Some say it was 90 feet tall. Some say it was 125 feet. I don't know. I was not there. So I don't know. But it was big. And it was wide. And it, we don't even know what the image was. But we know that there was this statue of gold that was made. And he wanted to have this great big celebration. You think of this, the special celebrations you have at church sometime. Everybody dresses to the best. They come out. They've got this big ceremony. And it's going to take place. And here's the thing he's telling them. He says, here's what we're going to do. Everybody's going to bow down to this image. Well, these three Hebrew, Hebrew children said, no, he ain't. No, that, that was the southern ones that, that said, no, they ain't. But they said, no, we're not. We're not going to bow down. Well, Nebuchadnezzar got word of it. Well, he was enraged. Amen. So we come to verse number 13. And he says, then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and his fury, the first thing I want you to notice about the promise of the rescue here in Daniel 3 is the fury. Notice the fury. Notice Nebuchadnezzar, it says that he is enraged and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. And it says in verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all the kinds of music you fall down and worship the, the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast at the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is it that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? He also talks about the fury in verse number 19 when it said Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. The fury that he had here was this, that, that he was so enraged because they were showing him up. He said, I've called this big celebration. We're going to look at this big golden image that I have made. And we're going to worship it and you're going to bow down to it. Uh -huh. And they said, no, we're not. And as they said they weren't, he was so enraged with them. The fury that he had, the fury. And, and he was so enraged. But notice in verse 16. We come to what we would call the promise of this rescue and the faith. We've seen the fury of Nebuchadnezzar. But then we see the faith of these three Hebrew children. I want to ask you something. How's your faith? How's your faith? Amen. I have a dear little old lady I go and visit every once in a while, a friend of mine's mother. I'll go and visit her, and there's not a time I leave that house at one time during our conversation, she'll say, how are you in the Lord? How's your faith? Amen. And I have to tell her, I say, we're good. We're good. I know I'm a dirty, rotten scoundrel, and he's my Savior. Amen. And here's the faith I want you to notice in this story. Verse 16 through 18, it says, And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Amen. Verse 18, he says, But if not, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I want you to notice a couple of things. When they said that, he said, you know, so a lot of people says, well, let's just, let's just go along with it. It'll be all right. Let's go along with it. We're better off to just go along with it. Can I tell you something? There's so many people just going along with some of the stuff in this world. Don't go along with it. Take a stand. God here has got these three Hebrews. And he says, and they, they could have just said, well, everybody else is doing it. Let's just go ahead and do this. Let's just follow along. We won't cause a stink. Yes. 
Well, I can tell you this. As Christians, you and I sometimes need to cause a stink. Amen. Take a stand. Amen. Take a stand. It's going to cost you, Amen. but take a stand. Amen. He said also that when he says, well, let's just bow our knees, but we won't bow our hearts. Uh-huh. We'll just bow our knees. Sound familiar? Uh-huh. We'll just take our knee, but we'll not bow our heart. That's right. Getting quiet. But I'm telling you, your faith. The example of these three right here and their faith. He said this that when he looked at them and he said, if it be so, if it be so, there in verse 17. Here's the thing I would tell you. God promised uh, this, that faith rests on the commands and the promises. It does not on the arguments or any explanations. I don't have to apologize for God. I don't have to apologize for God. My faith is not about explanations and arguing. But what happens is this, whatever it is that you need a rescue from, God's promised you just like this example of the three Hebrews here. When he's talking about they are there and he says, if it be so. But in verse 18 when he says, but if not. Well, I don't, you don't have to ask me to do this again, but I'm going to say something. Uh, I am not a prosperity type preacher, teacher. Amen. And the reason is because sometimes God takes us through the fire like your song son. Amen. Sometimes he takes us through those things. God is a sovereign God. Amen. I don't know what the end result is. Amen. He may not heal me. He may not give me that new promotion, that job. Right. It may not happen that way. Amen. And I think the example of you and I when we go to prayer, it is prayer time. And when I go to prayer, it is kind of uh, uh, arrogant for me to say, God, here it is. Here's what you got to do for me. Uh And God's going to say, well, son, let me remind you of where were you when I formed this world. And let me put you back in your place. But the faith of these Hebrew children is the great example that you and I need to look at. I love this example in Isaiah, the 12th chapter. Turn with me if you've got it in Isaiah, the 12th chapter and verse number... uh, in verse number uh, 2, Isaiah the 12th chapter, verse number 2, he's talking about the, um, the, prom- the promise of the rescue. And where is Isaiah? Oh, it's back here. Isaiah the 12th chapter, the second verse. I'm going to take you somewhere in just a minute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you to see how well you know where your Bible is. Isaiah the 12th chapter, the second verse. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. Now, I want to take you to a book. It's a real simple book. It's real easy to find. It's right next to Zephaniah. Turn over to the book of Habakkuk. <laughs> and it's in the uh, third chapter, and verses 17 through 18, talking about the faith here. Here's the thing we do. It says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Amen. Doesn't sound like a good situation, does it? Amen. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Amen. I will joy in, in the God of my salvation. Amen. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind's feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the Amen. chief singer on my string instruments. Yeah. Here's what happens. The example of the faith of these three The faith that they had that they needed rescued. Sometimes, here's what we do. We begin to bargain with God. God, if you will, heal me. God, if you will, get me that job. God, if you will, get me that promotion. God, if you'll come through financially for me. God, I got a bad diagnosis. If you'll come through for me, man, I'm going to be the best servant you've ever had in your life. Uh Don't bargain with God. Believe in God. That's what I would tell you. The other thing about this story that we're reading here in Daniel, and I'm going to hurry, the fury, we've seen the fury, we see the faith. But I want you to notice the furnace. Now the furnace in verse 6, starting in verse 17, uh, in 17, but verses 6, it's mentioned about the furnace in verse 17. But then come to verse number 19. It says, Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form, and form of his visage, visage and was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, he just elevated his fury even more. You're not going to bow down? 
And notice what he does. And he spake and he commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was want to be heated. I've always thought this interesting. Nebuchadnezzar, I think sometimes when you're in a rage and in a fury, you got to get insane. You don't think clearly. Amen. Here's why I think that. And have you ever thought of this story that you're so familiar with that he said, oh yeah? And he got so mad, he says, I'm going to heat it seven times hotter. Uh-huh. Well, when he throws them in, if you heat it seven times hotter, it's going to kill them quicker. If he would have thought, he would have thought, well, I'm going to torture you longer. Uh-huh. Just food for thought there. It's free. <laughs> but here's what I'm saying. You and I think of this story. Nebuchadnezzar, he wasn't thinking clear. No, he wasn't thinking clear. He said, I'm going to heat it seven times hotter. And then he said he commanded the most mighty men that, they were in the, that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And he says, then, these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell down, bound in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Now the furnace here was a—it's kind of like a had a big old chimney spot at the top. However tall it was, it's pretty tall on a hill, and it had an opening at the top. And then there was an opening in the side that they fed the fire, and the oxygen was allowed to go in there. And you think they'd thrown them into the fire? Now it was so hot, it was so intensified that the three—the ones that threw him, the three, the three in. They were burned up. Uh-huh. Now, it talks about their clothes. It's important. And because of time, we won't get into it. But they had the tunic. And they had their, their attire on. They had nice clothes on because of this celebration they were at. Uh-huh. And they had what's called a turban. In the original language, it's really a turban they had on their heads. And they were bound and they were thrown into the fire, this furnace. Now, I want to notice this in the, the verse 24 and 25, the fourth man. What's the fourth man? It says in verse 24, the Nebuchadnezzar and the king astonished rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto him, Oh, true, O king, it's true. We threw three in there. Well, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have not hurt, have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Some says it was Christ. Some said it was a pre, uh, pre, uh, pre-Christ and it was also an angel. I don't know. I wasn't there. But I can tell you this much. There was four in the fire. They Amen. threw three in there. Amen. The furnace itself was, I'll tell you, somebody says, well, describe this furnace for me. Well, here's the best description I can give you. I can tell you how big it was. It's big enough to hold at least four men. <laughs> I got to thinking about it. I would like to know the dimensions of the chimney. I'd like to know what it was. I'd like to know, but I just know this. It is big enough to hold at least four. Amen. And so we see that as, as we see our story there. It unfolds there, that furnace, that hot furnace. And then the fifth thing of, of the promise of the rescue is the fire. What about this fire? Well, the fire in verse 26 and 27, then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, and he spake, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. Yeah. Verse 27, we all know this part of the story. And the princes, governors, and the captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men. They examined them. I don't know if they was doctors, but they examined them, trying to explain this away. And it says, upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Amen. Nor was a hair on their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire passed on them. Amen. The only thing that burned up in that fire was the ropes that bound them. Amen. A lot in that right there. A whole lot in there. Yeah. But you think of this right now, as you, you think of this story, what a great story it is. That the fire, it had no impact. They didn't even smell singed. Their clothes didn't smell of it. Their hair wasn't singed. The fire. Real quickly. I want you to notice in verse 28, I'm going to give you two things you can fill in on your blank right there. Either the flipping or the failure. Nebuchadnezzar flipped his story. 
or he failed to do what he set out to do. Whichever one you want to use. Is the, uh, it says in verse 28, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake, and he said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, yielded their bodies, that they might, serve, might not serve their worship, nor worship any god except their own. Amen. He flipped. He went from this, he went from enraged to now seeing how powerful their God was. Amen. And that their God had heard Amen. them. The promise that he had said, I'll promise I'll rescue you. There it was. Nebuchadnezzar flipped. The last thing on this passage right here is notice in verse 29 and 30. The favor. Uh -huh. The favor. If I was to title just this passage of scriptures, I was writing down and trying to use all the, uh, it's bad to say, I was trying to use all the F words. But as I was sitting here... <laughs> And I'm sitting here and I'm trying to write this down. I'm thinking, man, if I want to title this message alone, it's from fury to favor. Amen. From fury to favor. Nebuchadnezzar was so enraged. Man, you, you ever get so mad? I know I don't get mad. But they, if you ever get so mad in your fury. But at the end of it, notice the favor. Uh -huh. The favor he shows. Verse 29, therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against God and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can be delivered after this sort. Amen. He says then in verse 30, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Amen. You want a promotion? Amen. Go through the fire. Amen. Some of us don't want that promotion that bad, do we? Amen. No. But this story here, as we come to this, and I'm coming to a close here, there was, there was a poem that I love, this little poem that, that I've read before that talks about this, kind of goes along with this story, and it says this, When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. Amen. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Yeah. You may be going through a fire. I don't know what you're going through. But there's somebody that's either listening, that's either watching, or that's sitting in this auditorium today that needs to realize the promises of God. Yeah. The promises of God that, that, that he says that, that he's going to see you through the fire. The promises that he's going to be there to rescue you. To, if you need redemption, he's there. He's made you a promise. Amen. Of all of those things, turn with me to the book of Romans, and I'm fixing to close. In Romans, the 15th chapter, and in the 4th verse, notice what it says. Romans 15 and verse 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort and the Scriptures, might have hope. Amen. It goes to this. All of these things and these stories were written for you and I, for our learning, yeah. that you and I can see the example of these three these three, Hebrew, did you realize, how many of you can tell me how many times after Daniel, the third chapter, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the story continues? Anybody? It doesn't. We hear no more about them. We hear no more about them. But as a little boy, and I remember the Bible story, them talking about them three Hebrew children, Amen. those young men, and what they went through, how they relied upon the promises of God. Now, our faith is tested. And here's what I want to close with is this. Faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. Amen. You say, well, I never seem to be tested. My faith is never tested, and, and, and I'm tested in ways. God doesn't tempt, but he does test. He puts us through the test. So you and I need to realize that. As I close here, I want to share this with you, that, that if I was to, to say this, I talk about the promises of God. In the book of Romans, that Roman road, when we talked about redemption from the beginning. That Romans road we go through, there's statements of truth. Romans 3.10, there's none righteous. No, not one. Amen. Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. Romans 6.23, that says, for the wages of sin is death. It's talking about the second death, to be eternally separated from God. Uh -huh. But he says in Romans 5.8, another statement of truth. That whosoever, that, that, but God commended, he demonstrated, he showed forth his love in that you and I, for you and I, that in while we are yet sinners, dirty, rotten scoundrels, he died for us. Yes. He sent his son Jesus. Amen. That statement's of truth. But then I want to give you a promise of God that we always close with Romans 10, 13. We go back to that. That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You may be that whosoever.